Hello so much. Thank you guys for coming out and braving like terrible traffic. Um, I'm here in a bathrobe uh, for your viewing pleasure. We have a lot of other wonderful people here for your pleasure. I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce, uh, well I don't really have major introductions, but I think we can just go down the line and say who we are. Uh, I'm Benny Johnson. I work with, <laughs> oh, see, I thought it was open source. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mike Godwin. Uh, I, I work here at uh, R Street. I'm the Director of Innovation Policy and uh, General Counsel. I'm Trevor Burris. I work at the Kano Institute where I do constitutional law, constitutional history, legal history, and legal philosophy. I'm Emily Zanotti. I'm the digital editor of American Spectator where I fix people's sentences for a living. <laughs> Beautiful. And we're going to talk about Star Wars and politics and all the incredible fit places where they all cross over. Um, to begin, this isn't really a panel because Star Wars is something we all share, something that George Lucas kind of didn't figure out in the prequels. Uh, so this is like a thing that I want everyone's interaction with. That is not us like describing to you. Most likely you guys know more about Star Wars than us or at least little facets of it. So uh, as, a, as, a thought, as a thought process concept here, I would like for people to yell out the Star Wars character that most reminds them of Donald Trump. Chewbacca. Jar Jar Binks. Darth Vader. Anyone else? Oh, Java. Oh, Boss Nass. Boss Nass. Very nice. Java. Why Java? Who's giant cat? Can't really understand it half the time. Who's a little of that? Who's a rat type character? Salacious Crumb. Anybody else? There's one more really good one out there. All right. No, not for me. I just like I want people to be able to yell and like make this all. This is all us together, like right, talking about this. So please, like at any point, like feel free to add your comments or your thoughts on this. We'll jump right into something that I think is a very important Star Wars versus modern day society crossover, which I think is actually our first slide. Is Han Solo the first Uber driver? <laughs> <laughs> I have the following case. Have a look. What you might not have noticed in the <laughs> is these important logos that were there. This is what he does when you say you're going to Arlington, okay? and that's surge pricing. Uh, <laughs> this really important, like surge pricing, uh, goes to a thousand credits. Um, seven, 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 and did fly, they call him Captain Solo, that's what a dog figure calls him. Uh, but then he gets into smuggling. Now smuggling, of course, is not per se, from my perspective as a libertarian, it's not per se wrong. Um, if you think of Dallas Buyers Club, for example, or, you know, or you know, with the Liz Taylor story that came out recently, said kind of thing, um, or getting people around uh, in their own car against an existing cartel. And if we seem to think things about the empire and the use of the trade federation, we probably suspect that their control on trade, and this is a big, we don't know exactly how the empire is funded um, in a various way, so uh, tariffs could be a big part of this. So their control on trade is probably quite extreme. So now people the tariffs like, are oppressed. Exactly. We tariffs so so for Han Solo to getting around this existing cartel, it makes him something like the There is an export control issue related to smuggling. I mean, I think that uh, obviously, uh, if you have an empire with strict rules and tariffs, they'll often use their authority to to prevent goods of various sorts from being shipped from planet to planet. Yeah. The thing is, though, is that usually, like, you can kind of gain the assumption from a new hope when he's like first talking to Obi Wan and Luke in the cantina that he doesn't always transport like humans explicitly. It's yeah. Spice. So yeah, it's, it's usually like items or some kind of cargo. Yeah. So isn't there like a new Thing like Uber, where they'll like bring you items. Yeah, uh, yeah. Totally Clink, Clink brings you alcohol for example. Yeah, it was on day uh, delivery. Yeah, it was on day delivery. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd say he's like a, I'd say he's maybe more of like a Clink driver or like <laughs> and, a you know, insert for, item. Well, well, some people right would use Han Solo to argue for more regulation because you know he shot first. <laughs> and we'll get to that. Emily, any hot takes? Well, there's, also, there's also the question of how he relates to the war on drugs, correct? Because Spice is basically what he's running out of. Castle Run, basically, and and so, you know, he's <clears throat> unless your Uber driver is also smuggling cocaine, I'm not really <laughs> sure exactly where it relates in, but he does 
he does openly defy the laws of the empire, and that's how he makes all his money. So, the, speaking of the empire, next slide. <laughs> the Death Star costs. This is, my okay. is the Death Star a military industrial complex boondoggle? Really? Like, they, they cost 2.86 quintillion dollars based on a Stanford study. Uh, <laughs> I think Zach makes it. I think, Zach makes it. I think and yet got. the government no. makes it completely. Open to well, word. look. Like, this is the, the this thing is about the thing about the Death Star that I think that really bothers everybody <laughs> is why the Death Star is clearly a failed approach because uh, it has a, a back door. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! What is this? What is this? <laughs> oh my God! Oh my God. Patches, <laughs> I am your father. <laughs> 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 I always thought you had Jedi Yeah, you're a little lower tax. Hello, Josh Norquist. Josh <laughs> 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 exactly. Norquist is here to answer the very important question how does the Empire raise so much money to build and buy $2.38 quintillion dollars worth of Death Stars? During the Republic period, period of the Republic. They said there were thousands of planets uh, under their governance, which means you could have a very low tariff structure uh, and still raise quite a bit of money. But during the period when the empire took over, clearly we know they had smuggling, so tariffs were too high. Or smuggling Han Solo wouldn't have a job. Job of the Hutt wouldn't have work to organize. And clearly during this period, various planets went into revolt, like we did when the British Death Star was being annoying to us. Mm -hmm. British Death Star. <laughs> British Death Star. <laughs> what is the a marginal tax rate in the Empire? <laughs> well, it must have been lower in the Republic, which didn't have the revolts. And also and didn't have a standing so, army. Supposedly, and, and to fund a standing army, you needed higher rates. Yeah, supposedly under the um, old Republic, it was a 15% income tax plus tariffs. So, how did you know? <laughs> I read about it because you somebody, George Lucas last night? <laughs> somebody had said something about the Federation, you know, uh, cordoning off Naboo, and obviously that was a, a precursor to allowing Palpatine to become head of the Senate, but th that prior to them enacting the sort of Federation regulations about Naboo, that it was a 15% income tax rate plus tariffs. But, I don't know what Steve it was underneath, <laughs> <it's a flat laughs> um, underneath the um, underneath the empire rule. I suspect it would be much larger because we know even like with the moisture farmers on Tatooine, they were taking their goods and giving them back in excess rather than allowing them. Oh, the yeah. Vatican Encyclopedia. <laughs> Mr. Norquist, uh, Mr. I'm, I'm agreeing with your, your premise of that. Like, obviously, Job of the Hutt's uh, crime empire, empire or syndicate became a bit more widespread once the empire took over. But Java was in business even when the Republic still was around. So taxation under the Republic may not have been that much different from the imperial taxation system. Taxation even in a Republic is too high. <laughs> 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 it pays to avoid it, the taxes. But any movement towards higher in the US, the colonies, the British colonies, prior to 1774, taxes were 1 to 2% of GDP. Uh, the British were talking 3 or 4, and we took the guns out. So it's change in the wrong direction that gets rebellions. By the way, there's a strong argument, I think, that in the deleted clip, of for the Second Amendment, which is that, and you know that with a, a single blaster, you can hold off all the sand people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> and also just for general insurgency. They, they, they do go single file to hide their numbers. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're on the Second Amendment point, that's one of my areas of specialty. It is interesting that a lot of people will ask me if I bring up the right of rebellion, 
So I know you think people will have a huge uh, opportunity, a chance against the combined forces of the United States military. It's like, well, actually, insurgents have done a pretty dang good job against the United States military over the last 50 years. So you can in, in Star Wars, too. And you can actually do a lot to uh, resist uh, the insurgency. If you look at something that relies on government work, government you know, assessment, the Death Star was fatally flawed. You know, they, they it's a military concept. Lack of wait, 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 hold for a second. Hold for a second. Zach, next slide. Yeah. 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 The Empire's pro Second Amendment. And concealed carry. I stand your ground. Yeah. Here are some very like rock solid examples of how pro Second Amendment. How pro Second Amendment the Empire is. <laughs> Uh, to your guys' point, there are a lot of guns floating around, and most of them are concealed. But that's because uh, Darth Vader can go like this in the bullet. Yeah, but most people can't do that. And <laughs> Jedi's are a myth by the, by the point of that. Right. So that's, that's not the main reason I'd be you know, packed with people, by the way. No, it is absolutely pro Second Amendment. But it also could be the case that guns are illegal in private hands, and they simply can't enforce, as any government can, uh, such, a, such a commandment. <laughs> What's yeah. that? No, no, this is a this is a this is a this is a one one nine. <laughs> <laughs> you play Battlefront, you realize that this is a but but I, I mean I also we we mentioned this uh, maybe come up later, but uh, the stormtrooper equipment seems to be very, very poor, which is its own question of whether or not the people have better guns than the stormtroopers. <laughs> Oh, then I just can't shoot those helmets. And that will come up. Yeah. 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 In many, yeah. many different yeah. scenarios, yeah. Han Solo is allowed to conceal carry. Yeah. Um, and it's accepted in, that's accepted in Lando's home. Well, it's, it's accepted it's in, very in, well the in the bar. In the bar. In the bar. Yeah. 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 I think Mike wanted to go back to the Death Star. Yeah. I didn't want to mention the Death Star only because uh, it is an example of the repeated failures of government policy. Uh, that you build a Death Star, but if you build a back door in, it's just inherently insecure. That's a better metaphor for uh, encryption policy than I, I could have invented. <laughs> but then they, they keep it, then, they, then there's a Death Star too. So we have like a whole second war, but do they still want back doors? Yes, they do. <laughs> because it turns out that uh, you need, you know, Lando Calrissian to come in and, and help blow up the second Death Star. See, I think that the Death Star is the F-35. And, and it is the F-35. But don't forget the second Death Star. Stellar so the first Death Star diameter is 160 kilometers. The second Death Star's diameter is 900 kilometers. I mean, basically this entire, like, well, you know, it's really rock bottom. Big, we got to go big or go home. Clearly, yeah, literally we did not build a big enough Death Star. <laughs> that was the reason it was a problem the first time, so we're going to more of those. By the way, Han Solo, Han Solo is open carrying, by the way. Big yeah, enough. That's true. Let's try to stay on, no, let's stay on topic. <laughs> so what we talk about stay is, is the screen, <laughs> the screen question. So based on the screen question, does anybody have uh, questions or comments for the? I believe you have a few. You, you right? can't, can't make an argument for... Second Amendment with Tuscan Raiders because Luke has his he has his hunting rifle and it does nothing. Now using all of these clips you can, but you can't you can't talk about it in terms of Tuscan Raiders in the film because it's it's not effective. It's not it's not it's not the way the movie actually goes. He tries to use the hunting rifle, it gets battered away, next thing you know he's on the ground. Well, he's using a hunting instead of a personal protection weapon. Also, it's in his car, so it's extension of the. Aye, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the Second Amendment doesn't guarantee that you always win. Right. <laughs> this is what? Yeah. Yeah. Thermal detonators yeah. also. No, I, I mean, I think this is important though because it's part of a broader point, which comes up in me. Maybe you have a side about this, but Tatooine is not well in the Phantom Menace, which I unfortunately watched a couple of nights ago. Um, <laughs> they say it's not in the Republic. Uh, and it seems like either a failed state or some sort of frontier. And, and he says to Anakin at one point that it would have been, could they find that he's a slave? And she says the Republic slave was, and he would have been born in the Republic. So it seems to be controlled by the Huts. So at this point, you have the Wild West, you have the concealed carry, you have the open carry, and questions about you know what you can do in a failed state, even subverting the laws as much as they don't exist. Well, ultimately, the Sand people are just losing a lot of the staffs anyway. Yes. Yeah. So. But I, I think it's true that, that Luke's practice with personal weapons certainly informed his mm -hmm. ability to, to blow up the Death Star. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the next the next question. Is the Empire fighting an unlawful <laughs> drone? Uh, Zach, clip and clip. <laughs> I mean, these are some pretty deadly drones that are able to... 
It's a probe droid. It is a probe droid, but it is armed. Well, a rose by any other name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it seems clear. I mean, it seems clear that uh, well, yeah. if, if, you, if you're not committed to actually sending your own troops, there are a couple of choices. You can have clones, or you can have uh, droids, or you can have clone, dro drones. You just put them action together, <laughs> yep. and really you have drone policy. Um, it seems to me because that that turns out to be more cost effective than putting troops on the ground in a lot of cases. Certainly, when you're taking out uh, individual uh, despots. So. Well, the, the question of drone policy only gets ramped up when they get offensive capabilities, and that I mean, it would be you know we have a lot of criticism of drone cap uh, our capabilities, but they're mostly based off of killing people. In this scene, they're looking for the rebel base, and they're which is on a bunch of hostile plants. They sent drones to these bases. And it's a different drone policy for just merely. I mean, the U two, it wasn't a drone, but it was merely a surveillance uh, apparatus to try and. But I don't know if this droid was intelligent because that's, I think that there, there's a huge. That's what I was thinking. Is there an individual some, rights issue if they're disenfranchised with intelligence? Oh, yeah. Aspect of like, aspect of facial oh, recognition no. software or something because it was not defensive. I mean, it was clearly offensive. They were just looking at it to shoot at it. Yeah. But you have, and the drone all of a sudden takes an offensive position, so it is a surveillance drone, but it has some sort of intelligence capabilities because it then and weapons. alerts uh, a large contingent of Imperial soldiers that that's what's going on. The probe droid does self-destruct. Uh, Ham says I didn't hit it that hard. Mm -hmm. So it is self-destructing, and its intelligence and its intrinsic intelligence doesn't seem to be that way since the Imperials, as you see Vader and his generals, analyzed the pictures mm -hmm. of the rebels' field generator and their ion cannon. Yeah. So, thoughts? I saw a couple of hands. I was going to say that the, if we're asking if it's unlawful, the question needs to be is there some kind of law in place protecting? Because obviously, this is meant to be first and foremost a surveillance droid. Otherwise, it wouldn't have like self destructed after it was attacked, or whatever. Like, it's not meant to be like a hellfire predator, you know, destroyer thing. So, you know, is Hoth a part technically of the Empire? Is it fall of the Empire's laws? Are there people there that are being surveilled that should not be or, you know, a natural right? Did they get a warrant <laughs> before they sent these probe droids? You know, so. well, you, I mean, I'd like to see the even warrant. if you're not a member yeah. of the. Uh, I think Revan Paul well, would have something to say. I, I just want to know if the, if the droid self destructs without an act of free will. <laughs> Or was it really just a, a, a directive? Because I think we come back to the issue of drone intelligence, of Army droid, 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 droid intelligence. Uh, you, so you had a, yeah. Oh, I was just going, I think you guys were touched on a little bit, but just the discretion side of it, um, you know, they're, they see the footage and the generals are all skeptical of it to begin with, and the major's like, yep, that's where they're at, we're heading to Hog. And so it's sort of thing where there's no, well, he's the decider. <laughs> I actually, I should have brought it. I have a Return of the Jedi card from 1983 that has uh, Vader on it that says the decider. <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty great. The discretion of the person watching from the drone station think, of, like, what is the target? Is it an actual target and all that? I think this is going to lead directly into our next question, which is, you know, what are the moral status of clones and droids? Because... I mean, if there were hashtags in Star Wars, you could really argue that droid, droid or clone lives matter. Um, what is the moral status of a clone or a droid? Yeah, this is a big one for me because I think it is the great moral blind spot in Star Wars that, that, uh, and, and Star, that George Lucas seemed to never really care about, especially because C-3PO. So there's different types of, uh, yeah. uh, there's different levels of this. So if you've been getting a fan of this, again, which I unfortunately watched recently, there are some protocol droids that serve the Jedi in the room that they're waiting in, and they're clearly not charismatic, to say the least. They're just doing a program. c 3 actively fears his death. He says, like, don't deactivate me, like, when, when, after he learns that R2 <laughs> ran away under. He actively says that um, he doesn't want his memory wiped, 
uh, at the end of uh, episode three. He's afraid of having his memory up. And R2, whose memory is preserved, just laughs at him in face of this, because R2 is a real bitch of the entire Star Wars <laughs> universe. Uh, <laughs> my friends, he, just, he just laughs at everyone constantly. And C-Tripper is like being basically and yet they make it kind of stable. <laughs> they do. I mean, it's stable. It's, you know, I mean, I have a little bit like the honey. It's a fashional civil union. It's, it's a little bit like the honeymooners. I mean, really, it's like, <laughs> like uh, or the, the Dickersons. So, uh, yeah. Do support for right marriage. So I think it's a huge problem. And I think it goes back, uh, Mr. Wikipedia, I'm just going to call you because you know. Uh, it's awesome. What was it? Uh, Fernando. Fernando. So the political structure of the empire is unclear and the republic and the question of whether or not you have individual rights guaranteed by the central government <laughs> within as a constitutional scholar, this is very interesting. Before the Civil War, you didn't have individual rights guaranteed in the states by the Bill of Rights um, and until they incorporated the Bill of Rights. The question of whether or not the interior planets, the planets in the Senate, how much the Galactic Senate is able to penetrate and decide, oh, we're gonna have a law against droid slavery. If they have that type of control, inside the member planets of the Republic or the Empire, either way. I mean, the Empire is presumed to have that control. The Republic probably doesn't. Well, you do have episodes of the Clone Wars animated series where they get into clone rights, where some who decide that they are going to, you know, they are sentient beings. So they touched on that, but they didn't get into that in the film because they just decided, for those of us who really loved it, we wanted to get into the I think well, droids are underrepresented in the Senate. Oh, absolutely. And there's also the question of how quickly they become sentient. I mean, you see plenty of droids represented throughout the Star Wars universe that are clearly not. But then there's obviously the yeah, the little mouse droid. <laughs> you know, and and then you see something like C three PO. Well, what's the jump from a, an unsentient droid to a sentient droid? Is there a potential for that sort of development? And then if there's a potential for that sort of that development, then when does that sentience start to take root? So you have this sort of like long-term robotics question. I, I mentioned this question to Peter Zitterman the other night. He said, that, said well, no, dro droids are programmed to be, to be servile and slaves. I'm like, I've heard this argument before. Uh, it didn't work back then, and it doesn't work now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, maybe it's already decided because you have you have Steve Rubio who immediately, like when he's bought by Luke in episode four, he's like, this is my new master. Boom. Like, yeah. I'm totally going to start this person. So it's like voluntary. You're obeying the laws. Yeah, it's voluntary though in secret videos. I'm like, he's not wanting to escape. That's what a, a sold slave would say at the time well, in, no. in Virginia in 1840. That's my new master. And like, I, I can't I need to obey my master. But he has no, nothing within him that's like encouraging him to go. Whereas R2D2 does. But and R2D2 so he's got still a program to go find master. Kenobi. I think yeah, everyone agrees that R2 boy. is the smarter most. <laughs> but, but then think about someone like, like, IG, I'm a nerd. IG88, <laughs> you know, the bounty hunter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. He's, he definitely has a time because if anyone tries to enslave him, he will destroy you, Django style. Well, you could, I mean, you could do an, an individual assessment of the capabilities that, that give you rights. I mean, it's not much like different than the abortion debate, for example. Right. An individual yeah, assessment of, of how much you mind. need uh, for, for this, uh, but it, it deserves to be done. Right. I mean, it really is kind of disturbing how much we laugh at c 3 pos Fear of his own death. Question in, in, in those movies. In so in the prequels, Tatooine is not part of the Republic, but in the original trilogy, is Tatooine part of the Empire? We were talking about that previously. Oh, we haven't not, established no. it. Um, well, Wikipedia only, doesn't know either. There's, so <laughs> there's obviously laws that allow the bar owner to discriminate against the droids by not letting them in. So maybe that. Well, but maybe the bar so so they're still in safe. There's no civil rights act. And there's no ultimate law enforcement. I mean, we know stormtroopers are on the planet, but there's a question of whether stormtroopers are there to keep the peace, or stormtroopers are there because the, the ejector pod landed on town. They could just be a projection of force into the area. So who's more deserving of rights? The the droid with a, you know, crazy personality or the clone that's essentially a biological machine that stands in, that stands in the way of gunfire. I mean, all the rights is, is pretty black or white. They're both deserving mm -hmm. of rights. I mean, the conscription is wrong, even when you invent the. But the, but the clones clearly don't have any personality. They stand there and they get shot. When that's what they do all the time. In the universe, the clones do have to undergo sort of an um, indoctrination process. <laughs> he really wants to say something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. How about things? Stormtroopers in the original trilogy are not. Clones. Right. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Um, they are. They're they're not clones. They're civil they're, servants. They're <laughs> like you said, number two, the very first episode of Clone Wars, 
that, that aired in September of 2008. They, they get into this because Yoda is sitting there in a cave with three clone troopers that are under his command. One of them's injured, and he tells each one of them to take their helmets off, right? And they say to him, We all look. He's going to safe space, you guys. Yoda says, yeah. No, through the force, I see that you are all the same. So, like, yes, I mean, they do have they certain certain characters in the Clone Wars treat them as if there's a certain degree of humanity. Yoda right. does, Anakin does. Obi Wan less so, but I, I think there's an argument. There's always sort of this assumption that the clone process wasn't exactly perfected by the time that they were starting to get the clones. Right, they're and evolving, and so that they did evolve. Well, they did evolve. And if your mother drinks when you're in the womb, you still have rice. Right? <laughs> you still have rice. Right, but there's also the um, conscription process that happens in, in the original trilogy, and then ultimately, like what we're seeing as, as the Force Awakens and into the um, into the extended universe. That there is actual indoctrination processes, and they're telling the stormtroopers they're they're picking people up off a planet, they're putting them in indoctrination chambers, and they're telling them the Jedi burned your family, they killed your brothers and sisters, and so they're actually, you know, they're not necessarily clones; they're actually actively like conscripted, slave, enslaved people. So I think that's a cult school. So like the, the clones, I think the whole idea that they didn't get the process correct from the beginning kind of begs begs that these uh, the clone troopers be given rights because they're not necessarily in not uh, in not indistinct individuals. Check your natural born probably. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, can we get a round of applause for Darth Narcos? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is the highest cash bracket of the Empire? Too high. I think we should jump next slide here. I think we've uh, that's, that's yeah. it. just the space United Nations. Yeah. No, I, I see a lot of shaking heads. This, is, what, this is what's called the ungovernable right here. Right. This, right. The this Galactic thing. Senator Somewhere in this is Jennifer Lawrence. Like, uh, it's it's okay. Rose Garrett. I have, I have quotes on this. This is kind of interesting. I these up here. So here, here are quotes about the Galactic Senate uh, at different points in the movie. So and, and this is interesting too. So, so uh, Obi-Wan, it's been my experience that senators are only focused on pleasing those who fund their campaigns. Interesting <laughs> campaign finance on my specialties. And they are more willing to forgive the nice use democracy to get those funds. Uh, and one point, Palpatine says the Republic is not what it once was. The Senate is full of greedy, squabbling delegates. There's no interest in the comic good. The bureaucrats are in charge now. Yeah, now but, like Palpatine, the, but Palpatine would say Yes, he would. <laughs> but maybe because he's arguing but, for, essentially, for relegating the Senate. Well, we cannot presume that, that Palpatine thinks he's evil. Like, he thinks he's good. There is no, no man wills the evil, they will a good Aristotle. So he thinks what he's doing is good, and so he, this is his real opinion. Well, but, needs to be but, but he actually well chooses the dark side. It's also known that the Sith Lords, you know, they limit their membership to the rule of two. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and as a, and they end up dividing even against themselves, uh, so that if you're, you know, look, if you're Count Dooku, you're close. You know, you're going to get killed. I, I would say that uh, that the that the Galactic Senate more like the European Union because the supranational state, and they they elect the, the the Chancellor, who then becomes the Emperor and assumes a lot of authority. So he's more like permanent member on board of Belgium, where it's just like nobody really cares about. Well, them. there's this. That's right. The Senate in the Republic, I think, is is a little European Union like <laughs> because it's unfathomable to ordinary people <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how anything ever happens in the Senate, and there's no not adequate documentation. It's not very accessible. Uh, there's some. Sometimes royalty gets in there. We don't know how that happens. Uh, they don't have a standing army either. They have to ultimately. Uh, they either uh, uh, recruit people or else they create clones. That's it seems funny. like uh, what is who came up with the term demosclerosis? I mean, this is this is, yeah. this is this is this problem that this this is clearly the most insane attempt at federalism ever ever. And this is a galaxy, not a solar system, a galaxy of thousands and thousands of planets. All you know, you don't know how much this goes up. All trying to decide something democratically. I mean, first of all, can we just agree that it's kind of silly? I mean, I do have to defend. I mean, I don't defend this. Ninety percent of these people at any given time are asleep. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just, just like, like what committee they're on. Or <laughs> My other question would be like, since there seems to be like no regulations of people mm -hmm. in between, is the, is the empire actually, or I should say, republic at the time actually, uh, open borders? No, well, well, they're saying it seems to be porous. Mm -hmm. Um, it does seem to be porous. So there seems to be some kind of trade over the border. It's definitely the best thing about the EU is the open borders part. But it, the, again, going back to what I was talking about, when we're talking about the droid slaves, it seems that this, the individual pilots have most of the autonomy to determine their own policy. It is unclear how much they, they can determine their own policy. How do you look at Naboo? Go ahead. When Naboo kind of, when they're trying to sort of elevate Palpatine, Naboo. Is closed off because Naboo's policies are no longer aligned with the Galactic Senate, at least. So there's some some sort of regulation there that encourages people to fall in line with what the Galactic Senate wants you to believe, but it may not necessarily be a rule of law that goes down right to your particular level. Yeah, I think that I think that the Senate illustrates the, the movement of the Senate to uh, uh, the movement of the uh, of the Republic to the Empire re reflects of uh, uh, Plato's Republic uh, and the criticism of democracy uh, where he says that because people act selfishly and demand different things from their government it becomes disorderly, and then to get order, you ultimately find the impulse to speak well, up. As, as much as I hate this, this this parody of democratic rule or whatever it is, it is true that when the first movie open episode one opens up, there has not been war in the galaxy for a thousand years. So maybe Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations sort of came to fruition, and we figured it all out. Well, I think it's an interesting deal too of how you look at this and from you know political body standpoint, oh, 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 <laughs> and stuff, but then uh, you also have sort of this balance between it and the Jedi having this sort of like super political role, sort of kind of maybe. And well, they're like, they they clearly have some kind of combination of moral authority and enforcement authority. <laughs> Uh, but it's also mysticized, so it's a little bit like uh, the federal law enforcement community. Anyway, introduce Congressman Blake Rethel from Texas. Blake, we uh, ran over after some procedural shenanigans today. Oh, perfect. Uh, we're just talking about we're talking about something that would exist in this thing. <laughs> you got four hundred thirty thousand, but you want to deal with this? You like George R. Yeah. Is there one of your colleagues in this? Like, I'm not gonna answer. Oh, uh, uh, we all know it's Louis Kohler. <laughs> You know, we, we, miss the, we don't ever see the Jar Jar Binks campaign. I assume that 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 Jar Jar Binks was appointed to fill a vacancy. I feel like that was just like, get him out of the yeah. planet. I don't care. <laughs> it must have been a great moment though, because in Naboo, you know, the Gungans are like this pariah class at the beginning until they fight the war. So it must have been like we got our first Gungan senator. It was a great, great moment of equality and the inclusiveness in Naboo. <laughs> that is going to start us down a dark path. Uh, so, <laughs> we're going to be <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, tell the Republic. I mean, he motions for no conflict. He basically <laughs> destroyed the Republic. So, you think if you stand in the Republic, he is if you, literally if you the worst character in human history. <laughs> you know, in the, in, yeah. in, in, if Jar Jar Banks. He sent him to the Senate to get him off the planet because he won't do any more harm. <laughs> what he does is he goes to the Senate and and triggers the events that lead to the uh, uh, <laughs> the chancellor, really right. chancellor superpowers followed by <laughs> really authorization of the use of middle of growth force for Before we jump here to the next <laughs> one, uh, uh, like the uh, congressman, <laughs> is the United Nations like the Galactic Senate? I think they're definitely a uh, about as functional. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more thing. Quick point. So Jar Jar makes the motion for you know no confidence to kind of put Palpatine into power. Both Jar Jar and Palpatine are from Naboo. It does not hurt Naboo. He's representing the interests interests of the people of Naboo. It does not hurt Naboo to have the most powerful figure <laughs> in the galaxy come from their home planet. In, in theory, theory, theory intercept the people of Naboo. Theory, yeah. Yeah. That's what Huey Long was doing. Too, <laughs> <so it's probably laughs>
All right, next 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 question. Separate the church and state. How should the Jedi be tax exempt? Hallelujah! Where can I send Lois Lerner to collect? Let's discuss. Do, do, do we think that Jedi have incomes as such? It's a great question. I don't know how they earn money on property. Is, so. This is not my restaurant failure, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> but do, I guess now the midichlorians are sort of out of the picture, but there's a certain argument to be made that really? Jedis are not self-selecting, that, that you are born with sort of a talent that puts you into this specific class. But early on, they're actually agents of the state. Right. Yeah. And yeah. You, as a result, you typically can't tax agents of the state. Yeah, that's what Macaulay Chris Brown is about. Yep. <laughs> but they're regularly referred to as religion in A New Hope. Oh, yeah, we're Hokey religion. The old religion. religion. <laughs> the old religion. <laughs> that's also it's something that can be revisionist history uh, in episodes four, five, and six, that it was a religion, when in reality it actually was something else before, but that's just kind of what they call it now because the emperor doesn't want it kind of is a way to discredit it. This is something you might might because I think yeah. that they're just religion. I think they violate the establishment clause if they were put, put here. But like <laughs> uh, me and my colleague Aaron Ross Powell, who's a way bigger Star Wars fan than I am, just hard to do. But he, uh, he, he. I said it's a religion. He said, but the difference is, is that the, the force is true. And I said, well, yeah, that's what everyone in every religion thinks is the case. Well, they can actually move mountains. Well, they can actually heal people. I mean, if you have this huge thing, and the force is sort of a scientific thing, and the midichlorians sort of yeah. support this. Are you saying that they're actually... George is, Lucas, is, is Disneyland... Like, yeah, George Lucas says the midichlorians will not appear in episode 7, 8, 9. Well, that so was in his like, original draft. The, 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 the idea of right. them manipulating the midichlorians came along sort of when he got the opportunity to rewrite the series in 1, 2, and 3. But now in seven, eight, nine, they're going to. No, that's what the that's not what the Star Wars mm -hmm. the, the book says. It says that midichlorians were in his first draft. Yeah. But they were never meant to be the cause of the Force. They were just meant to be indicators that you were a Force user. <coughs> So. Yeah, but a Anakin has a high midichlorian concentration. The highest ever. <laughs> yeah, the highest ever. 20,000 units. You know, and he's <laughs> the amount of trivia you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> it's way over I know. He's like he, and he's just an obnoxious so, kid. So the, so the Jedi have a giant temple. There, it's in the capital city. They clearly are part of the political conversation, deeply affected. In one, two, um, and three. Yes. Yeah. squat in. Right, and by seven, they're just a myth. I guess they built the they built the temple uh, uh, on Coruscant on top of what had been the Sith temple. <laughs> well, that goes back to the old Republic. Isn't that right? Yeah. See, yeah. I need someone to validate that. Yeah. that I'm not before in the uh, dark times before, before the Republic. Yes, it's, it's we also we haven't <laughs> talked about the Roman Empire almost of this. The dark time before the Republic. Yes, the Sith control the universe and all this kind of stuff. But so yes, I don't know if that's canon. I don't know how Well, and then of course, Dan is itself like a. <laughs> Well, I, I always wanted to send him a note saying, "This is how you spell mitochondria." <laughs> <laughs> Next week. So, do you see any organizations like the World Bank and IMF, their employees are, are tax exempt? How would you guys uh, compare and contrast their value and service to society to the Jedi's and the galaxy? Well, I hope the IMF can't force choke me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, technically. Bang, 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 bang. Uh, well, look, again, going back to what I said, like as much as you want to criticize the Republic for being sclerotic and overrepresentative and bogged down in procedure, it was a thousand years of peace, which apparently was the fault of the Jedi. Oh, the, the credit. The yeah, the credit. credit, the credit sorry. The credit. Yeah. We, oh, we, the we like peace. Like, you know, the keepers of peace and justice in the galaxy. Not so. great for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so I don't think the IMF does that, so, uh, so I'll go with the Jedi. <laughs> Shouldn't the argument that the Jedi aren't really a religion, but more some, like a special forces unit or something like that, where it's a type of skill or some type of abilities you have, that, that it's not like a religious thing? And that it's something owned by the government as essentially a combination in like you, you almost see it as a King Arthur's court. I mean, I think that's kind of the the, the, the motto for it, or maybe part of the uh, inspiration for it. They are actually called uh, Jedi Knights. There's a, a, a mystic Merlin type element uh, to it. I mean, I think there's some uh, some similarities there, certainly in the way uh, in the inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, it, you know, I mean, I think that there's there are elements of there are elements of uh, you know w what I remember most vividly is uh, Darth Vader saying just saying reductively, you know, I'm not I don't follow the old religion or that old religion. He's like trying to be critical of it, but in fact, uh, doctrinally, the the Jedi believe that. Uh, you shouldn't yield to your an your anger and rage and fear. You should uh, uh, conquer it. And and as we know, if you're taught to go to the dark side, you have to embrace your anger and, and so on. But there are what a clarification. <laughs> so, so on, there are a few instances in episode four specifically where it's called a Hopi religion or it's called an ancient religion, and it's twice. It's once by Han Solo and then once by the Imperial. Uh, captain or someone on the Death Star in the little round table that they have, yeah. neither times is it rejected or is it said, no, we're not a religion. Both times, Darth Vader and Obi-Wan just kind of go with it. They don't say anything. They don't say, oh, we're not a religion. We're actually, you know, like, so. But Obi-Wan I mean, let a lot of false statements go uncorrected. And that yeah, that's true. true. But he was, yeah, you he really was a liar. Trust yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. What a bit of purpose. What, what Unless is you can't like go there choking him. That's I mean, he's a one percent. You don't yeah. believe in your ancient religions, and he's like, <laughs> 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 just like you know? Jesus, get that guy, <laughs> <laughs> like, beat him over the head. Like, <laughs> oh, and he says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. So maybe yeah. it is. Mm, that kind of leads me to think it might be a religion. So yeah, but a religion yeah. that is that I believe has deeply integrated into the state. It's regularly discussed and utilized, as you said, as a special forces, a religious special forces of the state. It, it's not a religion that requires faith, it requires midichlorian. And next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Did the Empire inadequately send troops to fight a religious, religious insurgents? Sorry. So the discussion of the discussion of a religious insurgency. Now we're we're of course going into episode four beyond. A so if we establish this at least loosely as a religion and as something that we were fighting for and used as a soldier of that religion, is the Empire sending troops in to go and squash this insurgency? Um, I, 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 I'm going to object to the premise of that question. It, it isn't a, a religious insurgency. You watch it. Uh, it, it, it it's a basic uh, fight against a tyrannical uh, government. The bulk of the folks fighting it aren't Jedi. They're just average folks. So I, I think it's more uh, in, in line with the traditional uh, revolution from a dictatorial government uh, Back to a path of freedom. I think that's not a Jedi driven thing. They've pretty much by the time the rebellion comes to life, the Jedi have long since been. Yeah, they really go down like this to know that. Right. Like, and like, Skywalker, like, yeah. Anakin Skywalker basically takes out what, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 Including the children. Uh, younglings, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's basically cutting it off its legs and saying, this is the last generation of Jedi to like, you know, my kids hide my children. You know, do not, I don't want to see them. They're the last of the Jedi. So they really do try to wipe it out. So it's hard to say it's a religious insurgency, even though I guess the elements of the Force are still there because they see a definite problem with Darth Vader as a Sith Lord. Well, I think that, so it's worth pointing out that in the first drafts of the script for Star Wars, or the Star Wars, as it was called at the time, <laughs> um, Lucas in the second draft made an explicit reference to Vietnam as part of what to compare what the rebellion was to the american empire so and he was very political in thinking about vietnam at the time because at the time 74 75 he wanted to he, he was very close to making apocalypse now uh francis ford coppola and him were kind of going back and forth on making this and he kind of wanted to make that he decided he was going to make this space opera but there are parts of this that he wanted to put in there so the insurgency is there with like meaningful political and this was historically the in the 70s we really hadn't started to uh, as a nation make uh, peace with the vietnam era mm -hmm. exactly just as a you know as someone who you know studied pop culture and radio television and film you really look at the turning point in america addressing the vietnam era was a magnum pi tv series yeah. in, in the 80s mm -hmm. 
Point of clarification? No. <laughs> just, uh, just, uh, but like something to bear in mind is in episode three, after, you know, Darth Vader, I mean, everyone's seen Star Wars, no spoilers, whatever. So <laughs> <laughs> just basically, you fly out of the window, all his hands things. gone, whatever. Rise, Darth Vader, blah, blah, blah. So Darth Sidious and Darth Vader are now officially the two Sith. Um, at this point, when he marches on the temple with the clones, um, it is an operation of the Empire. Like, it's no longer an operation under the Republic. It's the Empire doing that. So they send, not inadequately, very adequately trained troops to fight religious insurgents, so to speak, because they completely wipe out you know, every Jedi in the Jedi. That's four or six percent. Yeah, which is yeah. Im extremely impressive. So I think you're very impressed. Yeah, I mean, the, I would say but you have to you have to distinguish that between between that uh, the, the rebellion that we started with with Episode Four right. and the rebellion that happened under the Republic with the Confederation, which. Uh, was driven by the trade, uh, officially uh, by the Trade Federation's uh, resistance to a tariff, but uh, we actually think that might have been crony capitalism representing something it was a else. Yeah. Uh, with the Senate seat. It was a guild yeah. with a Senate seat, plus it had a secret agenda, which was the Sith agenda. Right. I also want to, on this, on this slide with the ISIS stuff, it is also worth pointing out that when the rebellion gets going, Later on, it starts on Tatooine, which is, I mean, or Tunisia, <laughs> which is a very, very sort of this is where rebellions rebellion start in frontiers and places where the Republic is not able to extend its power in places like Hoth. That's where rebellions start. And in uh, Tunisia. And, and also in, in Vietnam. And also, if you look at the American Revolution, you can read a bunch of journals from soldiers, British soldiers here, who just thought this was the most remote inhospitable place you could possibly be stationed and didn't really want to fight the war in the first place. So. To that point, Zach, next slide. Please keep your hands there. Oh, wait. Keep going. Now. Go past this one. Go past this one. Is Tatooine a failed state or an ISIS plan? Yeah. No, it's more like the, you know, it's more like the green zone. I mean, it really is more like uh, there's there's definitely a projection of imperial force into Somalia. Tatooine. Somalia. Yeah, yeah. maybe Somalia-like. Somalia, yeah. yeah. It, I, I, I'm going to go with it. it. I mean, there's a there's a spaceport in it with the classic uh, cantina uh, scene. Uh, but what what it really is, I think, is you look back in in the early history of uh, the world history. It's really a, it's a trading outpost. Of, like, you know, like, it's like Wichita in the 1840s. It seems, it seems a lot like Casablanca. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it's sort of a romanticized little trading post, but yeah. what's outside of it is just a bunch of farmers and people going about their daily lives and they don't really consider too much about the rebellion. Yeah, I know, I, I came to Tatooine for the water, <laughs> but there are no waters that I stay in the beaches. Yeah, yeah, no, the but the beaches. I, I was missing four. <laughs> See, I think that, so from my perspective, because I study the history of states and everything a lot, like I think that the I'm going to resist the premise a little bit because I don't know what Tatooine was like before. So I would call something like usually failed state means something like anarchy. Um, I would call North Korea a failed state too. So we need some sort of rubric where we can describe what something is between. Because if you were going to ask me would I prefer Tatooine to North Korea, I'd choose Tatooine. I would choose the Huts over the uh, over the North Korean dictatorship. So there's so if you look at sort of the Somalia example, in particularly if you look at Peter Leeson's from GMU's work on Somalia, which was the question of whether or not it's better off now than it was under a horrible state. It's unclear whether or not it's better off now than a horrible state. So it's it's failed in some regards, but it might be better than it was. The same. Amy you had a question. Where the Empire makes a deal with them to send Han Solo over there. That's his job with the HUD is the yeah, is a Robert Baron. Prime Lord, yeah. Prime Lord, yeah. yeah. It's a it's a cartel. Maybe the yeah. maybe the uh, example would be the a, a country run by the equivalent of a of a drug cartel. And then they kind of Skywalker, who I assume is a known renegade from the Empire, and they capture him, and they're okay executing him almost on the path of the Empire. The Empire comes in and, and gets the Huts to do some stuff, like give them Han, kind of like what they did with the Cloud City. And, and you'll probably collect that, that's it. Teaching you a bad exactly. I'm going to Wikipedia, that nerd out real quick. But, uh, I used to play a, uh, back in the day, this is a really 
fun game. Uh, it, was a, it was an MMORPG, so it's similar to World of Warcraft. It's called Star Wars Galaxies. Oh, yeah. And oh, it's yeah. Star Wars Galaxies oh, yeah. extensively. Um, you could go on Tatooine, and on Tatooine, there were a few different cities. And there's Moss Isla, which is shown in episode four. There's Moss Espa, which is where Anakin Skywalker is originally from, it's where Watto's junk shop is, where they're kind of where the pod races are usually held as well, um, or near there. Um, and then you have Bestine. And Bestine is the sort of like the de facto capital of Tatooine, so to speak. It's where all the administrative kind of dealings go on. And Bestine actually has an extensive imperial presence. There's not only an imperial base there, there's like tons of troops. The Imperial Academy, the flight school kind of has trainings there. So there's simply like... Those game developers taking poetic license. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's, it's from a game that says... Well, it's, it's from a game that says... So it comes straight from George Lucas. Because they mentioned Bestine and the deleted scene. Right, but... Yeah, that's where they would go for training. Right, exactly. Which is the confusion. But but what I was going to say was, on top of this, is that I think that Tatooine is uh, a failed state and that there may have been some kind of, not nation building, but in this case, planet building taking place on Tatooine, where the government's there, there's a military presence, occupation, possibly martial law, and yes, there might be crony capitalism because of the huts being there as well. So That would seem to me a little bit like Tatooine was a resource planet. So instead of being something that was taken over by the Empire, it was more like it was exploited by the Empire. It's a developing plan. Yeah, it's a like, developing well, Arrakis is clearly an influence on Tatooine. It's, it's, it's a source of Arrakis. Right. Can we, I mean, can we ruminate for a second on the absurdity of having a planet capital? This all goes back to the fact that these people need smaller, more localized government, and that's why the Empire <laughs> came along and said, I'm going to direct your entire absurd like, thing toward a, toward a progress of the future. I think yes. one of the other things that's important with Tatooine you have to notice is throughout the movies, it's one of the few places where they use like a different form of current. Oh, yeah, he says Republican. Yeah. Yeah. Republicans yeah. are not like, yeah, yeah, first I one where they're better there. And stuff like that. I think that may have something else. Oh, that, that says a lot to me from a libertarian yeah. standpoint. The Fed apparently yeah. doesn't extend very far. Yeah, the galactic Fed. This is Bitcoin territory. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or maybe they don't have the capital to have that kind of thing. Yeah, I exactly. Right. <laughs> I, mean, if like, yeah. If I mean, it's really kind of crazy because if you can redeem those Republic credits and all the Republic planets, then they have to be valuable. Yeah. I mean, just by definition, there has to be a monetary crisis going on in the Republic for the fact that he won't take Republican credits well, at some discount rate. Is, is the Moss Isley Cantina speakeasy? I mean, maybe they could track the money. Right, the you know. Yeah, yeah, maybe they, uh, who knows? Is this boots on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're putting boots on the ground to go find. That's basically, I mean, you mentioned that Bestine has a Republic presence, but I think all these droids are here. To find you those know, droids, <laughs> like, and there's almost never any droids in you and Moss Eisley. Yeah. Well, <laughs> otherwise, they would have been at the point of sale, right? Not wandering around Moss Eisley. They would have been when the the sand crawlers. Well, they went to the Jawas. And at this point, there were Imperials from. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Correct name. At this point. Well, I, I think that's right. But one of the things I, I and this is what raises questions for me about whether the stormtroopers are clones is that they're mostly the same height. We know that because Luke is shorter than they are. You're a little short, Chris, don't you? Uh, and, and so I think that because of the same height, they must have some clone dimension to them, even at this well, point. Maybe they're just height requirements. Well, I mean, even yeah, it's like the rock <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark Hamill doesn't seem that short. Must be the, <laughs> right, right. The, reason, the reason that you argue against that is because there were so, okay, in the present canon, not counting the legend stuff, Clone Wars and Rebels are currently canon, and there's an entire two episode uh, arc that deals with the fact that stormtroopers are not clones because there's some of the clones from the Clone Wars era that are still around who pulled their chips out so that Order 66 wouldn't they wouldn't be affected by it, and they very they very to see me make the you, you, you said that before, you know, but you said that before, and I, I, I respect your right to believe that the Clone Wars are canon. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone buys it. Depends on how old you are, I think. Like, 
if you're younger, the Clone Wars and Rebels are very I'm much. I'm telling you, in 1977, there were no not, Clone Wars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm too old for Clone Wars to be canon. I mentioned the Clone Wars a lot in the new Clone Wars. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a great one. It's not Clone Wars. This is a great one. You mentioned it twice. I'm not saying that there were no Clone Wars. I'm just saying he's on the series. The story arc in Clone Wars, the the cartoon, I guess, or whatever. It's absolutely canon. You're right. No, I'm sorry. I just so we want to respect everyone's time here. I think we have one or two more. Oh, last question. Are Sith really just objective? Well, it seems clear. I mean, it seems clear they're really motivated by selfishness. Uh, and there, but but actually, what I think of is you know there's the there's the rule of two, so you have to have the master who's clearly Ayn Rand, and then you have the rebellious apprentice who's Nathaniel Brandon, and then and then there's eventually a split that just happens, you know, among uh, you know among objective. See, I know Rebecca totally loves this, uh, uh, and, and really, I just told that joke for Rebecca. I don't think I don't think using the, the the sort of intuitional elements of the force would be acceptable under Ayn Rand. It's not I, 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 Ayn Rand would not allow you to feel any sort of uh, even though she did it constantly, she would not allow you to do that. So no, I don't think that they're. they're I know. I'm just symbolic of traditional evil. You're reading way too much into it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that for about an hour and a half. <laughs> It's okay, I've been sitting on the house floor. <laughs> Galactic domination goes beyond just satisfying my own selfish needs, although there have been occasions. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. So we want we, we want to respect everyone's time here, but do we have one since since Congressman was was late and since there have been a ton of great conversations, do we have one final question from the audience uh, that the panel can answer, starting with the congressman? Yes, sir. Your favorite Star Wars characters, and they can be from the expanded universe because I don't accept these these generally. <laughs> <laughs> you said they can. They can be. Can be? Okay. okay, absolutely. I mean, I've uh, that's a I, I have not actually uh, actually thought about that. I'm I was always kind of a uh, a, a Han Solo swashbuckler type uh, fan. I'm. I'm I'll I'll pick Han Solo, but reserve the right to think about it and change my mind. <laughs> Mara Jade. Uh, salacious crumb. Or, <laughs> um, I'm I'm a, I'm a really big fan of Wicked. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Like I'm a really big fan of Wicked. Like so, and I, I, some people hate Ewoks. I never understood why people hate Ewoks. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it to you. I <laughs> So there we go. Talk about Second Amendment rights. You don't even need Second Amendment to defeat the Empire. You just need logs. On the ropes. So, so make sure the government, like, you know, so out of my dead, uh, out of my cold dead hands, like with a log and a rope. <laughs> I would have to. I would have to say, yo 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 yo. <laughs> Definitely Jar Jar Binks. Uh, so thank you all so very much for I guess joining what should probably be a series on politics and Star Wars. Anybody, any Same papers? Next year? Can we, can we seriesize this? Well, that's a year, two weeks after we've got to A year from now, there'll be Star Wars Rogue One. Yeah. I know, we can yeah. have yeah. fan fiction. A lot of fans. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we could, yeah, do this three weeks from now. And <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Congressman, for being here. Hey, support the Yoda action. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.